Oh, hello. Just doing a little light reading. Hello, I'm Jonathan Weiner, and welcome back to another episode of Are You Listening? In this episode, we're going to be wrapping up season two. We're going to answer some questions that you've asked via various social platforms and in the YouTube comments. Please continue to ask questions. We're always interested to know what you're interested in and what you want to know. This being the last episode in season two of Are You Listening? You can infer that there are other episodes in season one and season two about EQ, about compression, about loudness, mastering for streaming, and other topics. So please feel free to hit the subscribe bell thing at the bottom of the screen here, and you'll be notified when we release future episodes of Are You Listening? and other similar kinds of educational programs on the Isotope channel. You can also go to our website into the Learn section on isotope.com. We have blogs, we have videos, there are manuals, our dither guide, lots and lots of opportunity for learning and leveling up your skills and your understanding. Now, I should start by saying we couldn't possibly answer all of the different questions that were asked because there were so many of them. In some cases, I'm going to try to answer individual questions. In some cases, I'm going to address topics that seem to be a point of intersection between multiple questions. Here's a question by Elio Meyer. I'm sorry, Elio, if I've mispronounced your last name. Most of my mixes end up too low. Is there any problem with normalizing mixes that are between minus 30 and minus 20 LUFS? Now, first of all, I should say, I'm, I'm assuming you mean integrated LUFS and not a short-term measurement or a momentary measurement. But the answer is no, there's not a problem. So long as you're working in a modern workstation that uses floating point math, we shouldn't have any trouble adjusting the level as much as we possibly want. I would invite you to go back and watch a video that I did uh, with Sylvia Massey, where she has exactly the same question as she's moving from working in the analog domain to digital. She was actually discovering that her mixes were sounding better when she was printing them fairly low, and she wasn't getting kind of a pinched sound that she was finding when she tried to push the level too hot. And you might find the interview with her entertaining as well, because Sylvia is awesome. What are intersample peaks? How are they produced? And how can we mitigate them? What an intersample peak refers to is the fact that when we look at the data in a DAW, we have sample points or numbers that represent the amplitude of a signal. So here you can see dots on the screen, each of which is a sample point. The blue line that connects these dots together is what happens when we play these samples out through a D to A converter. Each sample represents an amplitude point. That's the analog signal that we actually hear. Years and years ago, people used to think that we were actually listening to the bits, and that was one of the knocks on digital audio. No, that's not true. We're hearing analog audio that's recreated from these data points. I've purposely pulled up a very hot master so you can see the issue around intersample peaks. The blue line in between a couple of samples is actually higher than the surrounding sample points. Well, that in and of itself is not a problem. In fact, it's a good thing that the samples can recreate the shape, a smooth shape of a peak that's in between these sample points, except in a few instances. And one of them is when you have a very, very hot master. When you do, and if you take a look at the waveform at the top of the screen, you'll see that the top of the waveform will be clipped when it's played back. So the samples that are in the DAW are not problematic, but on playback, you will end up getting clipping. So two things that we can do to make this problem around intersample peaks less problematic, we can take the ceiling at the final stage as we're about to print our master file and reduce the level. In this case, you see I've got the ceiling set to minus 0.7. That means I've left myself a fraction of a dB of headroom so that even if the peaks on playback exceed the maximum sample value, I'm unlikely to have clipping. Now, this is true certainly if I'm printing a WAV file, but if I'm encoding to an MP3 or an AAC, I'll end up with a little extra level. It still gives me a little headroom so that I will avoid most distortion. You'll also notice that there is a button called True Peak. True Peak is another way of saying intersample peak. It also indicates that this tool does something called oversampling. Oversampling means creating new data from existing data. 
So if you were to look at these sample points, if I were to oversample, it would interpolate or insert new data points in between the existing ones so that I could have a better description in the digital domain of what would happen in the analog signal. Now this is really helpful when we look at a tool like a limiter because now the limiter is actually acting on the real peaks or something closer to the true peaks that would exist when the signal is converted out to the analog domain. Here's a question by Secretly Shivam uh, from Instagram. Is there a checklist for mastering? Like certain things that should check out for you to know if your master's set and done. From an aesthetic point of view, it's really kind of hard to say. We have lots of visualizations and tools to help you understand something about your master. For instance, if you look at the tonal balance control, you can see what is typical in the shape of a master, but that doesn't mean that your master necessarily needs to conform exactly to that shape. It's simply a guideline or a way for you to compare what you're doing against a, a measurement or a metric. Ultimately, you're the one who has to decide whether your master sounds as good as you can make it and whether you're happy with it. In fact, your emotional response is something that's worth giving extra credence to. That's the thing that you should really be paying attention to is, am I feeling, am I responding to, am I hearing what I wanna be hearing from my master? Having said that, of course, there are some things that are important that would qualify something as a master. Probably the simplest thing is to make sure that the number of bits in your file is correct. If you're gonna upload a file out to Spotify through an aggregator, or title or what have you, uh, some of the aggregators, and an aggregator is somebody who takes files and prepares them to be uploaded to the different streaming services. Some of them require 16-bit files. Some of them will accept 24-bit files. Some of them want WAV files. Some of them want only 44.1. Apple Music, for instance, will accept 96K, but they will then migrate it to 44.1 kilohertz for you. So understanding where the file's gonna go is important so you can prepare your master. So check off that you've got the sample rate and the bits right. You also wanna pay attention to level. Make sure that you haven't gone too close to zero, but also that the level is hot enough. If you leave 10 dB of headroom at the top of your mix and upload it, the distribution service is gonna assume that's what you want. And so they will leave 10 dB in a non-normalized playback setting. A couple of other things that I think are easy to overlook are to do what's called a QC pass. And QC in this case means quality check. So after you've printed your audio, sit down, listen all the way through from beginning to end. And the purpose of this pass is not so much to decide whether it sounds good, but to make sure you're not hearing any flaws. It's so often that I will hear a click at the beginning or a fade cut off at the end, or maybe something happened in a, a buffer underrun during a render and there's a little dropout or a click or a pop. You wanna check those things before you say this is done and it's ready to go. And that's kind of the, uh, the nerdy part of mastering speaking, where we're the last stage, where this is the last step. This is time to sign off because this is the version that people are gonna hear out in the world and we don't want anything to be wrong with it. The two other common mistakes I will say that people make is having some kind of templated approach. In other words, I always do X. Now, if you're mastering your own mixes, you may have sort of a, a common moves, common gestures that you do. A lot of people you know, have their favorite compressors or they always pull out a little 400 hertz on the kick drum or the things that you know typically work for you in the context of your work. If you're working with somebody else's material, you can never assume that everything is gonna require the same treatment. Something may start by being too bright or too dark. And so use your ears, listen. Don't always assume you need to use a multiband or that you need to add top end. The only thing that might even come close to being a template is what you hear coming from your speakers and your references providing a compass point for where you wanna end up in the overall sound. But even then, you know, if you think about a record like Billie Eilish's record, if they had used a templated approach, they probably would not have made that record sound the way that it sounds. The last thing I'll call out as a common foible is to mono the bass, because typically bass is mono. 
And if you start to apply filtering and you don't need filtering, and this is true for high pass filters or for other kinds of processing, you will change something without needing to change something. You'll degrade the sound. In the case of monoing the bass, you may end up losing a little bit of sort of sonic spread and size in a mix uh, in the low mid range. You may lose a little bit of a sense of depth in the reverb. So don't start by assuming you need to mono the bass. If you have an issue, if you're looking at a vector scope or a phase meter, and you see that every time the kick drum hits, instead of being oriented vertically, it's oriented horizontally, uh, which might indicate some kind of low frequency out of phase component, then it's time to think about, do I need to mono the bass? But in general, it's not something that's a requirement. The next question comes from Jimbo Slice on Facebook. What sort of LUFS level should I aim for when mastering modern hip hop music for streaming? First of all, hip hop has a little bit more variance to it. My experience is that it tends to be a more um, diverse genre in terms of dynamic range. If you listen through Beyonce's eponymous record, you will find tracks that are incredibly, incredibly dynamic. So I would be careful about interpreting the loudness norms too religiously when it comes to, um, to a, a hip hop or any genre that's really, really strong in terms of the rhythmic component. Sure, run a pass, see where the LUFS comes in. And if you notice it's a little quiet, try pushing it, make sure that the kick drum and the bass doesn't completely fall apart. But I would rather give up a dB or two of level and let the kick drum really, really hit the way it's supposed to hit in that kind of genre. The next part of the question has to do with the different streaming platforms. Not all of them use the same standards and not all of them even use the same kinds of codecs uh, to evaluate the level. For instance, Spotify uses something called replay gain in response to LUFS. YouTube will use loudness normalization using LUFS. Apple uses a variation of something called PLR when they try to set their loudness normalization across all of the tracks. And they even use a different target level. They use minus 16 instead of minus 14. So all of that is to say there's a lot of variation. But those variations don't really matter that much. If you make something sound great, it will play back well on all the platforms. And remember, everything else that's playing on Apple is going to be uh, measured using the same codec. So it's not like you need to make a separate master for each and every streaming option. On the subject of LUFS and targets, there's something I think I've said it before, but I just want to make it crystal clear. So if you take a look at the meter that I've got on the screen, this is the Insight meter. We have three different measurements available. We have short term and momentary. Those are the measurements that you might want to use while you're mixing. Those are the, the values that actually reflect the moment to moment change. It's a little bit like looking at an RMS meter, except it includes some of the, the frequency weighting information. Then in the center, you have the integrated measure. I'm going to hit stop and you'll see that the short term and the momentary fall away. The integrated holds on to the level that has accumulated since I started playing. This is showing me a number that relates only to the section of the track that I played. If you want to get the integrated LUFS measure throughout an entire track, you have to play the entire track into the meter and then look at the integrated measure and find out what it tells you. Now, if you look at a tool like RX, there is a window that will show you what we call waveform statistics. It is calculating the overall level across this entire file. And here it will show you the integrated level of the entire program. So that's a safer way of finding out where your overall level is compared to the target and understanding what's going to happen when your audio is played back on a streaming platform in a loudness normalized fashion. Another question that came to us, I believe, from the YouTube channel. What can be done or kept in mind right at the mixing stage in order to achieve better stereo separation and imaging at the mastering stage? Here, I'm going to lean into the idea of just making it sound good, making good use of the pans in your mix. The thing I love about this question is that it directly connects mastering to mixing. 
the outcome at the end of mastering is so dependent on what happens in mixing. Don't expect that you can make a very narrow, well-balanced mix in mixing and then suddenly spread it out to wide stereo or increase the side information in mastering and have the mix hold together. It might work, but chances are something is gonna change. So make sure that you've placed all of the elements where you want them in the mix. There are lots and lots of things to think about in mixing when it comes to panning. The more you pan things, the more you unmask or demask things. And if you pan things hard left and hard right, those elements in a mix in a good playback environment will take on extra prominence. Don't expect the mastering to make it wide. We can certainly enhance the sense of depth and stereo image to a degree in mastering, but most of that work needs to get done in mixing. Another question, are there instances in which mid-side compression is appropriate? Lots of compressors are offering it now, but it seems like a strange thing to do to a mix. Excellent comment. In general, full-on, unlinked mid-side compression can make a uh, mix sound really weird really fast. And the reason for this is pretty simple. If the mid or the mono component is being squashed and not the side, then you're getting more stereo spread and more ambience. And then if you squash the side and not the mid, suddenly the mix gets kind of focused and dry in the middle. While that may sound like an interesting idea to have it moving back and forth between ambient and wide and reverby and focused and narrow and present, if that's happening in an uncontrolled way, it can be a little weird. It's kind of hard to control how loud the primary element, like how loud the vocal is uh, in the speakers at any given moment. So if you're going to do mid-side compression, I would say be very, very careful. However, there are a couple of fantastic applications. Probably my favorite is if I need to DS during mastering, I like to DS just in the center. So it's, it's actually not that I'm compressing both the mid and the side together, it's that I'm only compressing the mid. I'm only addressing, for instance, a lead vocal that needs to be DS'd, and I'm not gonna be messing up the high frequency information in the reverbs or the cymbals or the things that are panned. You can also think about this as an application uh, where a kick drum, the bottom of a kick drum is a little bit too big, punching right up through the center. Just compressing the center also could be a great way to focus the effect that you're after with the compression without messing up the entire stereo image. So those are good applications of mid-side compression in my, in my mind. All right, so here's a question from an unpronounceable handle, which I'm gonna now pronounce. Joaca Texas from Instagram. Can you, meaning me, give some advice or techniques for a better mastering process to the people who don't yet have great or adequate equipment, like good monitors or open headphones? Well, it's a challenging question, or at least it's challenging to answer it simply, except to say, practice. Take your mix, master it, listen to it, don't just listen to it in your environment. You've already stated that your environment may not be as good as ultimately what you think it might need to be to master, but maybe if you take your results and play it back in multiple other environments, you can begin to understand what's happening that's good that you're doing and maybe some things that are not so good. There's no substitute for hearing. The hearing apparatus and our, our understanding of what's in our environment is ultimately the thing that's gonna lead us to be able to make better decisions. I would much rather have okay equipment in a great environment because then I can decide what to do and I can also understand what I'm hearing. Another way to think about it is if you're training to be an Olympic athlete, you wanna put good fuel in your body in order to achieve the results that you're looking to achieve. And so that's all kind of a way of saying you need to be able to hear accurately in order to be able to make decisions to get the results that you're after. But not everybody is born with a mastering studio in their basement. Start where you are today and ultimately you will get better. And at some point you may decide that it's time to get better speakers because your skills are getting better. Here's a question that's a mashup, if you will, that all ask the, basically the same question or about the same thing. And this has to do with filtering, specifically the use of high pass filters. The question as I read it is, could you expand on why high-pass filters are problematic? 
Are they problematic in the same way in mixing? And is it okay to use them? When should I use them? When should I not use them? Let's understand the difference between a filter and a shelf. A filter is designed to just eliminate information. It, it, initially, it was really designed as something to eliminate rumble or some kind of noisy component in a signal. For instance, let's say you're cutting a vocal in your bedroom and a truck goes by and you don't hear high-pitched noise from the truck, but you get all of the rumble that comes through the house, up through the floor, and that gets into your microphone. A high-pass filter is a great tool to get rid of the rumble, right? You don't want that in your mix. And if you set the high-pass filter low enough and far enough away from the fundamental frequency of the vocal, you're good. Use a high-pass filter. You always want to listen and make sure that the filter isn't messing up something about the sound. It's not causing it to get thin, losing too much body or impact. But there's nothing wrong with a high-pass filter when it's the best tool to use. Shelves are very gentle and very hi-fi. So if you simply want to take a little low end out, something's a little muddy, a little heavy, and you can get away with using a shelf, you'll maintain more of the fidelity of the original signal. So that's the advantage of a shelf. In mastering, we're not trying to completely get rid of part of the spectrum, we're trying to adjust the tonal balance. So high pass filters change a lot having to do with the phase state of the signal and they add a little distortion. In mastering, that kind of distortion becomes apparent pretty quickly. So if you use a high pass filter when you're mastering, there are certain things you can expect to have happen. One is you will lose some of the focus in the very deep bass. Is that a problem? That's up to you to decide. Listen, make sure that you're not losing something about the very low end body of the kick drum or the bass. Can you get away with using a shelf instead? If the filter gives you exactly the sound that you're after, awesome, go for it, use it. In my experience, I'm happier using a shelf more often than I'm happy using a filter. But the other thing you want to keep in mind is when you use a filter, your peak level is going to go up. And so make sure you leave yourself some headroom at the point where you apply the filter. You can always make it up later with a limiter, but just anticipate that if you use a high pass filter, your peaks will be maybe a dB or 2 dB or even 3 dB higher than they were before. So I don't want to give everybody the impression that a filter is not useful or something to be completely avoided. What I am interested in is helping people understand what the trade-offs are and what the behavior is of each of these different tools. Don't do something just because you read an article where somebody said that you should. Use your ears, listen to it. If it sounds better, you're done. This question was submitted by Chris Goodhall underscore composer on Instagram. I have a feeling I'm not sure of this, but this question may come from a personal experience. You feel the track should sound one way, and the client thinks another. Is it hard to stop your emotions getting in the way of what a client feels the track should sound like, and you knowing what would be best for the track? Here's the issue. When you are working with someone else, so in this instance, obviously it's not the same person mixing and mastering, you're collaborating. You're collaborating, hopefully, because you value somebody else's perspective and their skill set. So if you do, then you have to be prepared to listen and listen carefully to the perspective that they're offering. So one of the, one of the things that comes out of this question that's been asked is the assumption that you know better. I think that's an incorrect place to start. When you're collaborating, you have to listen to what they have to offer and possibly allow for the fact that maybe your answer isn't the better one, at least not for the person you're collaborating with. So if you're the composer and a mastering engineer says to you, you know, I really think I need to tone down the mid-range because for the lion's share of the users out in the world, the track's going to be a little piercing or nasal or whatever the sound is. You want to maybe take their advice to account and listen and decide if you are willing to accept their advice and move forward. If you're a mastering engineer, and the composer says, I really wanted those violas or oboes or you know something that's piercing in a mix to sound piercing because there's some, something emotional that happens in the track. So I don't want you to smooth that out. I don't want you to push the level into a compressor because it's taking something away. As a mastering engineer, we have to take that kind of information and that kind of suggestion into account. 
the artist's face is the face that's connected to the record. It's, it's not mine. Maybe I'll have a mastering credit, but really the music ultimately has to make the artist happy. The artist ultimately is the person who is going to make the final decision. If you're going to engage in collaboration, practice taking feedback, listening carefully to what other people are offering you, especially if they're experts in their domain or have skills that you don't, and learn from that experience. Here's a question from, ready, I'm going to give this one a whirl, Lo Iathan or I-O-A-A-Than. I'm not sure if it's an I or an L at the beginning. My apologies. Can you give more detailed advice on what to do when the crest meter in tonal balance control is too far on the right? This gives me an opportunity to actually talk a little bit about what this thing is and what it's for. Let me start by saying meters are a way of understanding something, but they don't necessarily mean you have to do something. So in the upper left-hand corner of tonal balance control, you will see this thing that says crest factor. On the far left, there's a shape that indicates that we have a very high transient in this low band compared to the sustained level. On the far right, it suggests a very sustained level with very little transient, very little impulse. Already, we understand what this indicator is showing you. If you don't have any drums, it's going to be all the way off to the right, if you have a sustained bass. If you have no bass and just kick drum, it's going to be all the way off on the left. If that's your music, don't do anything. Don't change anything. There's a, a couple of hash lines that indicate that if you're listening to a track that's got drums and bass, that's within specific genres, that the low end crest, or the relationship between the strong transient and the sustained low end usually falls within this range. So if you're working on an EDM track and you think that the kick drum needs to be pumping through and you see the line off to the right, it might suggest maybe you pull the bass down a little or you push the kick drum up a little. Look at the indicator, think about the context of your track and what you're working on and decide whether or not you need to make an adjustment so that it falls a little bit more into the sort of common range. So I'm going to do a little more studying so I'm prepared for your next round of questions. Please keep leaving questions and comments. Let us know what you're interested in knowing more about. Go to the isotope.com website, download the products. You get a 10-day free trial. Hopefully, as you interact with the tools that we make, whether it's ozone or neutron, you're learning to get better and to do the work that you want to do better and better. So thanks so much for watching, and please stay tuned for the next thing that's going to come to you from Isotope.